due to um, and due to several other things. So the main objective of today's session is to focus on <clears throat> why we need to do the proper solution architecture and how to do that along with some uh, a small session on just to show you how to do it uh, by taking a real example. So uh, these are some of the topics that we would like to cover. So the first one we already did. And uh, so we'll be talking about what is a solution architecture, a role of a solution architect, uh, importance of the solution design, and how all this happened during the, the life cycle of our RPA project. And uh, yeah, and also some things around the uh, in the hands-on session. Okay, so going with the solution architecture. So when you say, uh, when you actually just think about the word architecture, um, what comes to our mind is a uh, design. Um, the same thing can be applied in any project, like any solution, I mean, any software engineering project, still you will see this solution architecture for those stuff. And not only in IT, in other domains also, you see this architecture thing coming in. Like for example, the most common thing that we all know is uh, when you're doing construction. Um, before we build a house, we just need to design it first um, based on the client requirement. <clears throat> then only uh, we can see, uh, we can understand what they need and whether our solution meets their requirement and uh, and how and what what is needed to build such kind of a, uh, a solution. So the same thing applies for RPA as well. And when it comes to RPA, since it's software, we call it a solution architecture. And uh, <clears throat> when you say the word solution, what we are referring to is, it's actually a, a, a answer for a problem that we already have. So uh, when it comes to RPA, the things what we automate are processes, uh, a, a process that is already in place in an organization where people do a lot of manual things. And uh, that's what we are trying to improve. So uh, to do that, um, to build our automation uh, system, uh, we need to come up with this architecture after doing proper requirement gathering and everything. So we'll talk about those things in a little bit more detail in the next slides. Um, so when you say solution architecture, the usual technical term is like evaluating client needs or problems and addressing them with systems that can either replace or improve the existing system. So. Um, one thing to note here is that RPA is not the solution for all the problems. Um, there can be other solutions as well. So uh, that's where we need to do a proper uh, requirement gathering and analysis to understand where RPA can fit in and how it can be fitted to that process. <laughs> and sometimes it can also come up with few additional uh, solutions as well, apart from RPA. Okay, so when you say solution architecture, it's the initial foundation for our automation solution that includes functional requirements and the stages of development. So that being said, who is um, doing this solution architecture? Um, usually a solution architecture is done by a solution architect one of the most senior people in the RPA Center of Excellence or the, in the RPA team. So <clears throat> what you see over here is other roles of a solution architect throughout the automation uh, lifecycle, starting from the enabling point and preparing stuff, designing and going down to uh, after sales support as well. So let's see what kind of uh, what kind of things a solution architect does in each and every stage. 
So enable is the very first one. So in here, we basically need to understand um, <clears throat> what are the what are the processes that we need to automate and uh, how it can be done. To and we also need to understand the existing infrastructure. Um, what kind of things that's needed to set up a automation solution in the environment. So all that is happening through the requirement gathering sessions and by talking to different stakeholders. So as a solution architect, once that is done, we just need to uh, focus on the initial infrastructure setup and uh, <coughs> preparing the development environments and just to see if the orchestrator is possible. If it's included in the solution, we can see what are the deployment options for orchestrator, like for example, <clears throat> whether we can go with on-prem or whether it's going to be cloud. And if it is on-prem, then we need to focus a little bit about the infrastructure side of things. <clears throat> so I'm not an expert in infrastructure side, so I'm not going to talk much around that area. But in general, if it's like on-prem thing, you need to focus on the, the things needed, like where you're going to host the databases, where you're going to host the <coughs> orchestrator, the machines needed, the processing power and stuff like that. A lot more things are there. And uh, then when it comes to uh, preparation part, where you actually prepare uh, the, the team, for this thing. So here we need to focus a bit about the best practices, what kind of best practices that we can use during development and what kind of coding standards that we can come up with. So as a solution architect, even though we are not working on a project, um, what you can do is a solution architect is usually, um, <clears throat> he also acts as a team lead for the RPA team. So in general, he can come up with best practices and coding standards, prepare some documentation around these things, share with the team so that um, whatever the project they are working on, they can always follow these best practices and standards. And uh, one important thing here that I have highlighted is the hurry framework. It is very important. And this actually helps a lot during the solution architecture. So we'll talk about the importance of RA framework in the next few minutes. Um, so in terms of the tasks that a solution architect do, um, during the requirement gathering sessions, usually a solution architect interacts a lot with a business analyst uh, because sometimes the solution architect might not understand the uh, the entire business scenario because they are like technical people. And in, in such scenarios to properly uh, connect the business with the technology, we need to meet that gap. So a solution architect and a business analyst can work together to bridge that gap and try to convert the requirements in a meaningful way. And then the feasibility study, the process optimization, where we can do this optimization and <clears throat> whether the process is suitable for automation. So those decision-making things will be done by the solution architects during the initial stages. And uh, the development effort estimation, the, sometimes the cost estimation, things like that will also be handled by uh, solution architects during the initial stages. And then, um, along with these things, we also prepare certain documents like the PDD and the overall solution design before getting into development. And uh, what kind of usable components can be identified and stuff like that. So all this is done um, by doing a proper solution design. Um, so that actually helps to come up with all these things. And uh, yeah, so that actually helps during the development as well. And uh, a solution architect does not usually do a lot of development. Uh, what they mostly do during the development stage is like um, capturing extra requirements, like 
you, we all know that requirements change during the life, uh, during development. So trying to identify those things and try to fit things in into the existing design um, are some of the things that the SA would do. And uh, when it comes to the development time, you probably need to lead the team, guide them on certain things and help troubleshoot and uh, yeah and also maintain the source control. And when it comes to testing, you just uh, mostly focus on the delivering the documentation and checking the functional testing aspects of the code and doing a proper code review just to make sure that the, the code created by your team meets the required standards and best practices and so on. And then it's lastly uh, sustaining like monitoring the solutions and seeing where we can improve things and providing the required support when needed, when the things are in production. And then, uh, yeah, so these are the things that we usually do, uh, the solution architect usually do in any automation solution, uh, automation project. So <clears throat> coming back to, the importance of the solution design. So we usually do all this stuff um, because of a uh, few things that are mentioned here, uh, like <clears throat> avoiding costly rework. I'll, I'll tell you one example. Um, once there was a project that I was involved in and uh, before we got into this, um, there was a, it was from one of the clients. Um, and before we joined with them, they had a solution designed for themselves um, on, a, on a particular process. But um, then again, they came up with a lot of new upgrades, a lot of new requirements. And they basically wanted to, you know, plug it in into that existing solution. So by doing the analysis, we figured out that the existing solution do have a lot of limitations and uh, there are some technical difficulties and issues. <clears throat> and uh, after we analyzed the process, the requirements that they have, uh, we figured out that it's way too difficult to combine those things into that existing solution. <clears throat> the main reason is the problem is actually what was the was the design because of the way it is designed it was not able to we were not able to scale it and include many other features and uh, uh, do the changes that that were required so basically uh, at the end what happened was we had to spend a lot of extra time uh, trying to understand uh, <clears throat> basically we had to create it from scratch <clears throat> so it was not, not just enhancement. So we basically had to go back uh, to the very beginning, understand the process end to end, um, capture all the new requirements and do the same thing again and design it from scratch. So basically uh, what happened was in terms of time duration, um, it was more like a one month thing, but we ended up doing that for like more than six months because of this uh, rework. So that's why a solution design is very important and it has to be done in a proper way so that uh, we don't really need to go and do this kind of rework. And it also helps to come up with accurate effort and resource estimation. <clears throat> so how we are going to estimate a process, uh, a delivery is based on the things that we need to develop and the complexity and then several technical things that are included in that. Um, so uh, if we come up with a very detailed solution design, we can easily see what kind of components are there and what kind of things can be reused throughout the process and the effort needed for each and every component. So going to the most detailed level will actually help to better understand and better estimate. It also helps to improve the efficiency and team collaboration. <clears throat> so as, as I mentioned earlier, um, 
in a team there will be like several developers working on the same uh, process you know building it so if you have a proper design in place you can easily split different activities among your team members and they will know how to connect connect the things because they know what kind of a design that they are expecting to build and it will actually help the collaboration and again for this also i have a example a real example which i personally uh, experienced during my initial stages of the rpa journey so we we had to do a poc for a client um so basically it was just a simple invoice processing thing and we were like it was actually one of my first projects uh, in the in our pa domain uh, all of us were new and we did not have that kind of a solution architect at the time so we did we just did a proper reform gathering and uh, came up with a uh, a solution for that and we split the different tasks among ourselves we created our each individual components but when we tried to merge everything together we ran into a lot of issues because we didn't know what the other guy was doing uh, we know that the part that they are building but we did not know how to combine everything together so it was a very simple process but we ended up doing uh, like spending so many hours trying to figure out things and trying to change things again just to fit everything together and uh, it was uh, it was messy so so these are some learning points that i had during my initial days which i would i'm like sharing now so just to show why it is important to come up with these things early on and uh, yeah so the other thing is to get a clear understanding about the functional and non functional requirements so when i say functional it is the stuff that the process should do what are the things that they expect it to do and perform the business logics and everything and when it comes to non functional things like the efficiency accuracy and things like that we can uh, come up with those things and uh, as i mentioned earlier um, we should be able to easily scale these solutions so it's not just a one time thing that we are creating so we have to focus on the future as well in case things needs to be improved it has to be easy and uh, yeah lastly to come up with a reliable and stable automation solution so this has to be uh, this is also one of the most important things so if you don't have a proper design your solution might not be reliable and uh, and again i'll tell you another example for this um there was a guy who reached out to me about a couple of years back um and he had a solution that he created for his client and he had some issues and he was trying to resolve and we just connected to discuss about that so the first thing that i noticed is um his solution is not really stable because again everything was in one big workflow not in multiple workflows the entire process was in a single workflow file and it was very very difficult to understand what is happening and from where it starts what happens in the middle and where it ends um even the debugging process was way too complicated to uh, figure out what's happening so yeah so these are some of the things that we really need to focus to come up with a proper solution for our clients so <clears throat> how can we come up with a good solution so that depends everything depends on the these two things the requirement gathering and the stakeholder engagement and uh, <clears throat> so basically uh, requirement gathering and engagement is where you 
talk to the people who actually do this process um, and you understand what they do uh, from where they start the steps they perform what kind of input they need to do those things what kind of output they need uh, at the end and uh, basically understand the entire process um so this is where we identify the flow of the process and based on this thing we need to come up with a <clears throat> a high level design of the entire process that we can use for and come up with a more detailed version which we can uh, use for development uh, so this is where it all starts and i'll tell you why this thing is very very important <clears throat> again another uh, real example um, <clears throat> so there was a, a time where i was involved in one document understanding project <clears throat> sorry and uh, it was like a very complicated process where you had to deal with a lot of complicated and complex documents. The process itself was very complicated due to uh, several business rules and everything. <clears throat> um, but we were able to develop and complete that solution just uh, within the within like one and a half months. Um, and uh, and there were some enhancements after all. Um, once it went. Uh, went to production, but things were very easy to implement. The main, main thing was, <clears throat> it's nothing magical. It's all thanks to the proper requirement gathering and proper stakeholder engagement. So what we did was, we did a proper awareness sessions to them because these are business people, right? So they don't know what we are doing when it comes to RPA. Um, they don't understand a lot of technical stuff because it's not that dope. just like we don't understand the business things <clears throat> as technical people. Uh, so we did a proper awareness session so that they know what kind of information that they need to share for this to be successful. And during the requirement gathering sessions, it was done in a very, very detailed level. Uh, we basically did some workshops to properly identify <clears throat> everything from start to end. And it was very helpful to come up with a proper design and uh, do the development. And it was very easy for the developers as well. And that was one side of the story. The other side, there was another project. Again, it's uh, some document understanding thing. Uh, but the challenge with that was um, they did not have a proper requirement gathering sessions. The requirement gathering sessions were done in very, very high level due to several restrictions and limitations, like the stakeholders are not available, they are super busy, and uh, <clears throat> the timelines were very strict and things like that. Um, so because of that, even the smallest things, um, there were a lot of concerns and you know things where we were not sure of while development. So we had to go back and forth to properly identify what's missing and properly identify the <clears throat> the requirements that they exactly need. And you know, going back and forth is also like messy because. <clears throat> On a previous call, we might have discussed about something, and then again, we are going and talking about that thing. They might also come up with a few additional stuff, um, which is going to complicate things a lot. So, um, so it is very important to do a proper requirement gathering uh, at the beginning itself um, and do a proper stakeholder engagement so that it helps a lot to come up with a good solution design because once things are created and if all of a sudden something pops up which was not captured then you might need to change a lot of things so if those things can be captured at the 
very beginning. You can plan for bootstrap as well. So that being said, now let's focus about why it's easy to do a solution design with the RA frame. So um, when you are talking about the RA framework, apart from the solution design kind of things in the usual development stuff, when we talk about RA framework, we talk about the dispatcher and performer concept. So what is the dispatcher and performer concept in very high level? Is where you, you are going to split one process into two uh, processes where one will extract the required data and put it into some place like a queue in the orchestrator for example and the performer will use that information and do all the processing needed to come up with the end result so it is like this concept is very important when it comes to solution design so in any automation project how complicated it is or how simple the process is. I personally uh, prefer to use the RE framework, even though it's uh, like a very sequential process <clears throat> because of the fact that it provides the required things to properly deal with exceptions and retry when things fail. Um, so that's one benefit that RE framework provides. So as a, uh, as a solution architect, you should consider that as well. And this concept of splitting things as a dispatcher, performer, you can follow the same thing in your solution design. Um, so main thing is you, your process might have a lot of steps and it might have a lot of uh, complexities like different complicated logics and so on but you need to understand and figure out where you can break this process into smaller components like put it into most, most granular level and try to split it split it into multiple processes <clears throat> nobody is going to like uh, kill you for like having multiple processes just to do a, uh, to complete the process. Um, I can tell you one example. <clears throat> there were one, there was one process um, that we had to develop. The process itself was very long, a lot of steps included, and it was like very complicated. And a lot of people are involved as well as stakeholders in the process at different different stages so we ended up actually creating about i think 15 15 sub processes to complete from start to end it might sound crazy but it was like very helpful and it was very easy to manage and uh, it was like the one of the you know the most complicated things splitted into simplified processes so the main thing was we were able to identify these handover points like from where you can hand over certain information to another part of the process and how to use it from there on so i'll, tell, I'll show you an example on how to uh, do that but um, to do that we use the concept of this algorithm and this dispatcher and performance. So that's the key that we are using. And in terms of the handover features, like from, from where you are going to store this data and from where you're going to pick it, we kind of focused on queues, data tables, or even a database. It could be an, and can be an Excel file as well um yeah so that's the concept that we are using and uh, in we talk about this discussion performing here these are like two different processes 
but in the process that I just explained, where we had 15 different processes, there were many dispatchers, <clears throat> many performers uh, to complete certain things. Depends on the project that you're involved in. So just keep that in mind, and that will be really helpful when creating these solutions. And the other advantage of splitting it into smaller components are, like if you need to change something at a certain point, uh, you only change one process and the rest remains the same. So it's very easy to test as well. You just need to test only one part and you don't need to test the entire process. So that's uh, one, another advantage of splitting it into smaller components. Okay. <clears throat> So that being said, let's now focus a bit around a small use case. Um, so this use case is around managing vendors. Um, so these are some of the steps that we can uh, we cover in this session. So basically, in this use case, you have like three different systems. <clears throat> where we extract, <coughs> sorry, where we extract uh, the initial set of data. Um, so from each system, you need to extract some information and do some filtering and some cleansing based on the data you get and remove the unwanted information and save that info in a centralized location. So this has to be done for all three systems and the steps needed to perform for each system is different. So there, this is why it all starts. And once you have the centralized uh, data saved in different files, then the next step is um, prepare a consolidated report for each and every person uh, based on that extracted information. So this will be like a, a raw file. And from that, for each and every pe person that we have in a separate database, we need to extract that information and you know, prepare some other files and put it into uh, a proper format and prepare these reports. And the key thing here is for each person, there might be more than one file based on the raw data. And then we need to email these files uh, to these people. And, uh, and once you email, we need to wait for the responses. So basically what they do is once they receive the file, um, they do some changes, they add some information and, and send it across. And once we receive it, we need to read the data they shared and uh, make sure that data is valid and it meets the required standards and everything. Um, and then proceed with the next steps, like updating some downstream applications. And if the data is not valid, or if something is wrong, we just need to reply back uh, to them asking to properly submit the data or if the replies are delayed, for example, um, there are some escalation things as well, like escalating to different uh, different people who manage these accounts uh, within the company. So this was a process that has to be automated. Um, so you can see by looking at these things, there are a lot of things involved and a lot of back and forth communication happening and a lot of validations. Um, so it's not a like a straightforward process. Um, so how we can automate this? Um, is it like a one process or can we split it into multiple different processes? Um, the main thing is, um, at the very beginning itself, once you identify these things, put it into a diagram. That's the most important one. And let me show you one. 
So if we take a look at this entire process in a very high level diagram, you can put it into a diagram like this. So you can, uh, from the start, you download the raw data from three systems, <clears throat> do the filtering and cleansing and prepare the consolidated reports, uh, save those files in different folders and send out the emails. This is a very high level thing. And then handle the responses. If data is valid, update the systems. If not, uh, keep repeating the same. Um, so this is a very high level diagram of the use case that I just explained. And why a high level diagram is important is because here you can capture the most important steps in very high level. And using this, you can build the detailed design. Um, so when it comes to the detailed diagram, let's have a look at that. So basically, um, <clears throat> this is how it starts. So earlier I mentioned that there are like three different um, systems. And for each system, you just have the usual steps like login and navigating to different pages, um, extracting the information and doing those things. So it's different from system to system. So that is why we have like three different lines over here. For each system, you do that, uh, filter the data based on business logics and everything and save it. You do that for all three systems. And then you extract that information and prepare the consolidated report with all items uh, for each vendor and uh, save it in the required folders. And then, um, then you start sending out the emails for each and every uh, vendor. And then you handle the uh, responses as well. So once the when the response responds, you can read that email. Uh, you can check the validity of the data and uh, complete the other steps. So likewise, if you like build a detailed diagram like this, I'm not saying that this is the best diagram that you can come up with. You can add more steps here in a real project because you will know each and every step. Um, when you're designing this detailed diagram, try to put it in the most detailed level where each box is representing a specific, <coughs> sorry, a specific workflow file if possible. So that <coughs> that can actually serve as a, um, a guide for your effort estimations. And that can also be used to um, come up with different small components in your process and share it with your development team so that they can focus on building those workflows. And let's say in other words, these are like three different workflows that I have, for example. And we have three people in the dev team and uh, they can, focus on each workflow. Along with this diagram, you can also provide something like what is expected as the input for this workflow and what is expected as the output. <clears throat> so that, for example, let's say um, there's a login workflow. To do the login, you might need to send in some configuration information and once you log into the system, you can maybe say that login is successful or not as the output, just an example. <clears throat> so if you like define those things in a different document, you'll be able to easily relate that into this diagram so that <clears throat> whoever is developing that component, they know what to expect as the input for their workflow to work and what they should return as the output. 
the important of this thing is this will be very helpful when you're putting everything together once it is there <clears throat> so that you don't need to like go through that um, crazy situation where you end up changing everything when you just try to combine everything together just like i had to go through some time back um <clears throat> so this these are the like, most important things um that we need to focus on when designing the most detailed uh, design for your solution so always remember like put the draw the diagram in the most detailed level and uh, have each and every box representing a workflow file so that you can easily use and when designing that um have the RE framework in your mind. So when it comes to RE framework, what are the components you have there is the initialization, the transaction data, and the process, and ND. Um, have this in your mind and put it in that order. So like, just to explain the RE framework in a very high level, in initialization, what happens there is uh, you just have everything that's needed to start your process. Like for example, if you need to log into a system to do some, uh, do this thing, to extract the information, the login and some initial level navigations can happen in the initialization part. And in the business, uh, like the process stage, you can do all the business logic checks and everything and get the required data and save it in the local drive. So this thing is actually more like a very sequential thing. As you see, we are not repeating any steps. But um, still, if you have the RE framework in place, if something goes wrong, it will automatically uh, retry. So even though it's sequential, you will have that functionality and you can easily change the RE framework to work as the sequential process. So just remember those things and uh, if you have that at the back of your head when you're designing this you'll be able, easily able to see how these things relate to each component. So now that you have seen the detailed design for our use case here if you actually look at this thing, you can see how we can connect everything together. So let's look at this first three first. Um, here we need to connect to system one and do the things and download the file. And same thing goes for this thing. And uh, if you actually look at it, this part can be a single process because it's mostly focused on one particular system. And that can be put inside a RE framework or those stages that I showed earlier. And you can build this uh, workflow. The same concept can be applied for this because it's very much focused on that particular system and it does not relate to any other stuff also. So if we like, to do that, we will have three different steps or processes to do this first initial thing. And all it does is save the data in a central location. So don't worry about the other stuff that happens after saving the data. For this particular thing, um, just focus on how you get the data. You do the navigation and extract the information, put it into the, uh, the drive. That's it, that's the first part. So it's easy and it's easy to develop and it's easy to maintain and it's easy to um, do some bug fixing as well if something needs to be changed. <clears throat> and it does not affect any other stuff. Just imagine having all these three in one process. It will be a lot more complicated if you need to change something. And it, there will be a lot of things to 
look at as well. But if this is like a one process, we don't need really need to worry about anything. You just can do the fixes there and you're done. And then once you have the data, then you do some other stuff, like you prepare the consolidated repos in our case. So if you really think about it, you do those steps once that data is available. So uh, that can be another process because these guys will give the required data and put it into some things. And then you can use that information without worrying how it got there and uh, do the remaining steps to give your output. So if you really think about in, it in that angle, you can easily find this kind of points where you can easily break the process into smaller components in, in the projects that you are working as well. And um, in this use case, so first three is done now. <clears throat> so when it comes to this part, we are not worrying how the data got there or whether it ran into any errors or not. We don't worry about anything else. Whatever the data is there, we just use that information, uh, do the report generation and put it into another folder. What happens after that? We are not worrying about it in here. So that's another small process. And once you have everything in place, then we need to email this information to the vendors. So <clears throat> when it comes to the email part, um, based on what I just said, do we really need to worry um, how that data got here? No, because for us now, we are only worried about how to send the emails and doing that part properly. And whatever the information available at the time this process runs, we just process that and we just do our task. So <clears throat> how all these things work together, that's a different story. So once you have all the processes in place created, then it's just a matter of, you know, scheduling these things in a proper order um, and ensuring that it has enough time um, to generate the required data so that the other guy can pick it up without losing anything in the middle. So that's a different thing. But in terms of development of these things, uh, you can easily put it into smaller components. And in our case here, once you send the emails, if you remember, I also mentioned that once they reply, <clears throat> we also need to send them uh, feedback in case the information is wrong. So um, that sending thing, if you actually break it into small components, you can actually use this process multiple times. So the first part, once the files are ready, you just extract the required info. For each vendor, <clears throat> you attach the documents, you generate the, the files needed, and you send out the email. So that's the initial part. And then imagine I am a vendor and I receive the email and uh, I do some changes to the data and I send it back. Um, and in another process, um, you can read that responses. So about the reading emails, we don't need to worry about it here. This is just for sending replies or sending emails. And reading can happen separately because anyway, there is a delay time between these two. And whatever the reply we get, we will read it, we will do the validations. And if we need to send a reply to the vendor again, saying that this information is wrong and just provide the proper information. Do we need to create that sending part again 
No. You can easily call this process within this one because we already have that created. So it's kind of a, like a reusable thing in a way. If you get the idea. <coughs> and uh, that's another benefit of breaking these things into smaller compartments or components. And then once you have everything in place, and when once you're focused on updating your downstream applications, that can be a separate process altogether. So you read the data from emails and extract the required information, put it into some place, could be a queue, a database, Excel file, could be anything. And the other process can pick the data from there, irrespective of worrying how it got there. So um, this is one example that I came up with, which I thought might be helpful to better explain this concept on how to break it into multiple components and uh, uh, to come up with some good solutions or a use case like this. So these are some um, real use cases that are the, um, which some of the things that I was involved at certain times and some of the things are actually things that I heard and read about at, uh, in different places. Um, but the main thing is, it's very important to do a proper solution design like this and, uh, and understand how to split it into smaller components so that it's easy to manage as, as I explained here. And yeah, if, if you put this entire thing into one big process, it will be so messy, so complicated. But once you break it into small, small components, it's, it's very easy. And uh, it's easy to manage as well. So um, that's what I wanted to share overall. Um, so if anyone has any questions, um, any thoughts about this, if you have experienced something like this, um, please feel free to share your thoughts and your experience. Hi, Lehru, Purnima here. Yes, uh, This is really a wonderful session, actually. Um, I'll give a lot of insights on uh, uh, especially the diagrammatic representation and you're practically explaining what you're doing, you know, uh, with, with the relevant use cases was just amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, from my um Punim, you are breaking um we couldn't hear most of the things you said just just before uh can you hear me now yeah is it better yes it's not okay is it i'll probably I can't have to hear talk you. about it Okay, so I, I was just mentioning that uh, uh, this was really a very, very insightful and uh, very useful session. And uh, the entire breakup of uh, from designing till testing and deployment, the way you have uh, covered it all in a nutshell in, in one hour's time without feeling the pressure of overloading is an art. So thank you so much. That is not something that I have seen in many of uh, the few other sessions where either they pack too many things or they'll take a small topic and just kind of extend it. So this kind of balance is gave a very, very insightful overview. Uh, so from my, uh, I have uh, recently uh, 
used RE framework and very similar one where I'm using three third party tools and under your guidance, I recall that, uh, you know, you had insisted I used RE framework. So initially, when the requirements came, it looked very simple. So even I was thinking, why should I, you know, go in with a couple of dispatchers and a performer? Uh, but you insisted that, you know, I will know the benefits of it as it goes goes on. And now I realize that not only the retries that you have mentioned, but also the transaction logs that, you know, each. So I'm able to know now if an error comes or if there is any any other data that I need to refer to from the transaction log, I know exactly whether my uh, tool, third party tool one is having a problem or two is having a problem and three is having a problem. So that segregation is there, which gives a clarity in my head. So thank you so much. And one more thing, uh, this is what I feel, but I may be wrong, so please correct me. Uh, I know that solution architecture designing approach is the best, but in the absence of it, sometimes we don't have the luxury of having a perfect uh, solution architect documents because many a times I think the clients also are not very sure when they start off uh, what exactly they want. And uh, so in that case, though RE frameworks may not replace it, I also realize that uh, adding on uh, becomes easier when we use RE framework. So it may not replace a solution architect document, but it somewhere supports you uh, in that area also is my understanding. So, uh, so let me know if, if that is right. And what beautiful diagrams. Oh, I have to learn this. The way you have done diagrams is like so neat. And thank you so much. Thank really you. wonderful session. I enjoyed a lot. Thank you for it. And to answer your question, yes, that actually helps. And uh, I can answer with another uh, another experience that I got from one of the projects. So some time back, I used to uh, work on a telecommunication related project. Um, so we did some requirement gathering things, and uh, we uh, did this diagram, um, and that was the one that we use for development. So uh, we were in the middle of development and we have we had already created some stuff. Um, but then this uh, guy from the business team, he came up all of a sudden and said that uh, we missed some components which uh, they were not, um, they did not share with us. And uh, so he felt that it is important that we should include it. And by that time, we have already done the design. We have already started development. And the things that we want to include do affect the stuff that we already create. So the initial thought, um, OK, so like there are a lot of changes. How can I put it into this solution? And uh, irrespective of the deadlines and everything, um, according to what they said, it's one of the most important things that they missed. And we had to now include it somehow. So the good thing about having a detailed architecture like this and uh, um, thinking of RE framework in the behind, so that's a different thing. But when it comes, when it comes to the diagram, um you can think about these things and you can actually visualize where you can fit these things in and if you are going to fit something let's say you, you need to fit something over here then you can actually really visualize the entire process with this diagram and see what things do change what things you need to remove what things you need to add in addition and how those things can be linked together overall. Um, so that's one advantage that we had in that scenario, because we had a very, very detailed design that includes every single thing, um, including certain decision points as well. So we were easily able to figure out what are the things that needs to be changed and the effort to do those changes. And within like a day we were able to give an estimate 
this is the new design and this is the estimate like extra time that we need and for the developers also it was very easy wow that's really really nice to know i just because have one even more. in the even in the workflows they already created uh, with that detailed design they were able to see okay these are the small things that i need to change yeah. to give this output yeah as a, as a developer i'm able to already feel the comfort of uh, somebody giving me a visual representation and say this where you have to fit this module in you know that's that's really uh, is uh, very very nice to hear uh, in this diagram i have one doubt like uh, you explain that how three processes independent processes are there so we use three bots right three processes like uh, maybe dispatch a couple of dispatchers and a performer or a dispatcher and a couple of performers uh, but in the common place where you have mentioned you know where the data is taken emails sent etc etc so all those goes into another process is it or are we tying it to any of these uh, okay is um, it like so, huh? yeah so these things are like three different processes <clears throat> and this is another and over here this is where you send out the emails so you use the data generated by those processes and just extract the info send out the emails that's one process okay uh, so if i am to put this thing inside the re framework in the init component i can use the extracting the information that's needed and everything land <clears throat> like the vendor list for example to whom we need to send the email and our transaction can be the vendor itself each vendor and within the process state you can do everything yeah. that's needed to send out that email right right and you keep on reporting that for each and every vendor so that's just one part but when it comes to understanding their responses to that that's a different process that can be handled separately in another maybe our framework again right right okay so that's that how comes you... with uh... yeah hey, you can go that comes with a lot of experience i think that the uh, to put it <clears throat> to segregate <clears throat> a large process and breaking it down into individual modules is also something not very easy at all times so it's great uh, yeah thanks nice to know this um, thanks for the great presentation I, i have a question can i ask it? yeah sure uh how would you do the communication between the uh, process and the upper part and the bottom here in, in your screen the send the email and the vendor response okay so this communication um i just draw the arrow just to show that this part uh, is part of the flow so basically these two processes in a way do not communicate because this guy is mostly focused on extracting the required information and sending that information to each and every vendor and that's it he's not worried about the response so whatever the information that's available here it will just send out the email and it will stop and uh, another process can um can work irrespective of knowing what happened here he can just focus on the email inbox whatever the email that comes in um <clears throat> so basically you can have certain log messages um or some records created in a database like for example for each and every email that you send maybe you can create a record in the database saying you sent this kind of a email to this particular vendor at this time on this day and these are some of the information you shared and when it comes to this process you don't know what happened over here you receive a email in your inbox you try to read it and in here you can maybe you know create a 
uh, set of activities that you can connect to this database and see whether this is a response coming from coming for an email that you sent earlier because you already have the record in the data for the emails you sent. And that way you can relate how many times you communicated with this guy. Like let's say for example, so yesterday you sent a email asking to update this data. And today I'm the vendor, I'm responding that to that email saying, this is my new data. And your bot is running and it identifies, okay, so he sent, we sent out this email yesterday and today is the reply and my data is not valid. So I need to communicate that. And he will send out another email through this process saying your data is invalid and please update it. And you create another record in the data. So this way you can actually see, um, <clears throat> keep a track of how many times you communicated with this guy and uh, like for how many days this happened, when he re responded and uh, even for these escalation things, you have the complete picture of what actually happened. So that way you can do that communication. Um, did I answer your question? No, nope, that, that's it. Uh, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I, I might have another one uh, yeah. related to how you organize the sub processes. Like, would you use a dispatcher and a performer or only performers with framework? Um, it could be a combination of both. So in this scenario, you can think about these three as three different dispatchers. And this guy over here is using that data to do something. And this could be another performer. And this process, can be another perform as well, because he's using that information to perform, uh, to send out the emails. So in a process, you can have multiple dispatches, multiple performance, and likewise. Depends on how you split it into different process. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have anything in the chat? There's one question. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me read it. Um, so using the RE framework, should we put the separate dispatcher XML file in the same project with the performer or do you recommend the dispatcher in a separate project? Okay, a good question. So this is also something that I have seen most of the time that people do. Um, what we usually do is um, sometimes we just create a separate workflow for the dispatcher and put it inside the performer process uh, somewhere in the init state, for example. Um, ideally, I don't really recommend that uh, because of the same reasons I mentioned earlier. If, if you are doing that, it loses the purpose of um, breaking things into different processes. Um, so the ideal approach should be to have separate processes. When I say processes, like a separate process itself, it's totally separate. And if it's like uh, in the orchestrator, you'll see a list of processes in the process page. And if it's the assistant, there you will see all these processes. You can even organize them in with proper naming conversions so that you, know, you can understand the order. And that's something that we did for that 15 different process uh, thing that we created for easy understandability. Along with the name, we also included a number at the beginning so that whoever is maintaining that and whoever is monitoring, they know which, which process is running right now. Um, so they don't really need to memorize everything in the head. So I hope I answered your question. Yep, and regarding the recordings, it will be available uh, after the session. It will take some time to publish, but it will be there in the event page. Um, any other question or any 
Thoughts? Test it again in the chat. Uh, should reformer be used for batchers? Uh, um, I didn't understand the question. Sorry. Can you should should we should we use a reformer for the dispatchers? Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, if even if it's like a very simple process. Like for example, this one, it's very straightforward and you really don't need to repeat the things. But as a good practice, um, it's always good to use the RF. And I know for a fact that some companies always <clears throat> impose this uh, practice, like irrespective of the process, whether it's too simple, too complicated, they always use the RF. Uh, so that's coming in as a part of their best practices and standards. Um, so yeah, so it's always good to use RE framework uh, based on, uh, it's mainly because of its, you know, these pre-trying capabilities and stuff like that. Um, so it's a little bit of extra work as you might think, but still it works. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and also the same goes for the perform, not only for the dispatch. Um, yeah. Anything else? Anyone? Okay, so I guess there are no more questions and in that case, we can wrap up for today. So thank you very much for joining today. And I hope this session was helpful to understand the importance of the solution architecture and how you can um, understand and split this into small components so that we can build a more sustainable and a proper design. So thank you very much for joining. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me on uh, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, any social media that you're in. Um, feel free to reach out anytime. I'm always happy to help on your queries. And um, yeah, so thank you very much and have a good evening. And I'll see you soon again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.